today we came to learn about uh, a very good um, uh, lecture uh, by Mr. Ashwin, uh, who was telling us about the contemporary uh, films of Indian cinema and how they have uh, given a new color, rather than just having those uh, very colorful and musical uh, films, which is amazing, but at the same time, the realities of life as well uh, were uh, shown in, in this lecture. And uh, so we thoroughly enjoyed it, and hopefully, once you see the clips of this program, I'm sure you will also enjoy it. And thank you very much for joining Apex, and thank you very much for everyone to watch this program. Thank you. I thank all of you for being here for this special event for more than one reason. I especially thank our dear friend and chair, Rosie Thomas, head of the Center for Research and Education in Arts and Media, University of Westminster. She has always been with us in many of our events. Rosie has taken the trouble of coming to this event twice, as it was canceled <laughs> last Friday on 24th July due to the torrential rain that seeped through the roof of this heritage building. I also especially thank our chief guest, well-known intellectual, story writer, playwright, and screenwriter of the rising Mangal Pandey fame. Thank you, Janav Farooq Nodisa. <laughs> But what makes today's event even more special and different is that we are paying our heartfelt farewell to a very dear friend and supporter, Sangeeta Bahadur, <laughs> the Minister for Culture and Director Nehru Center for the last four long years. I remember interviewing her for a conference in July 2011 when she took charge and have interviewed her again for conference yesterday. In these four years, she has taken strides not only as a promoter of South Asian arts, but also added two books to her CV, namely Jal and Vikral. Another talent of Sangeeta ji is that she is also a singer. May I please request Sangeeta ji to come on stage and request Durdana Ansari OBE to offer her a bouquet as a token of our appreciation. Sangeeta ji. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, it's a very different experience today, standing here not introducing the, uh, the event and the theme of what's going to happen this evening, but actually being called on stage like a guest. Um, I suppose that is something that, w that has been coming for a, for, a, for a while. It was just that I was trying not to think about it because I have so enjoyed my tenure here. Four years is a long time. And um, at the end of it, all I can say is a big thank you to all of you, so many of whom are now personal friends, including Laditji himself. And um, I must say that um, all of you have been so supportive, so encouraging, so kind. And um, you, I blame you for making the time fly so quickly <laughs> for me. Um, but finally, it's time to say goodbye. And today is actually the last event um, of, of my tenure here. Ehsan mere dil pe tumhara hai dosto Ehsan mere dil pe tumhara hai dosto Ye dil tumhare pyar ka mara hai dosto Ehsan mere dil pe tumhara hai dosto Ye dil tumhare pyar ka mara hai dosto Banta hai mera kaam tumhare hi kaam se Hota hai mera naam tumhare hi naam se Banta hai mera kaam tumhare hi kaam se Hota hai mera naam तुम्हारे ही नाम से तुम जैसे मेहरबान का सहारा है दोस्तों ये दिल तुम्हारे प्यार का
मारा है दोस्तों एहसान मेरे दिल पे तुम्हारा है दोस्तों ये दिल तुम्हारे प्यार का मारा है दोस्तों ये दिल तुम्हारे प्यार का मारा है दोस्तों थैंक यू सो मच एंड दिस वाज रियली फ्रॉम द हार्ट थैंक यू फॉर एवरीथिंग थैंक यू coming back to halke memorial lecture i would like to say that since 2003 we have covered a wide range of subjects and issues some of the highlights are of course the maiden lecture by veteran film archivist p k nair saab on the early realism of v shantaram filmmaker said akhtar mirza's lecture was his rather unorthodox take on iraq war and its images and terminology used by tony blair and george bush maybe rosy remembers uh, this uh, lecture as it took place at the university of westminster we had the well known hindi writer the late dr gautam sasdev who spoke on prem chand and hindi cinema again at the university of westminster filmmaker chandraprakash duvedi spoke on pinjar literature and cinema in 2011 kusum pant joshi's research on niranjan pal uh, turned into a falke lecture of course i spoke on partition films and the conspiracy of silence way back in 2006 another significant falke lecture was by documentary filmmaker shivan singh dungarpur the future of indian cinema's past that dealt with how pathetic is india's film preservation of its classics Veteran filmmaker Sham Benegal delivered 10th Falke lecture here at the Nehru Center in 2012 entitled New Indian Cinema Circa 2012 when he interestingly dealt with the films of new generation of filmmakers like Anurag Kashyap's Black Friday Gangs of Wasipur and Sujay Ghosh's Kahani and so on Sham Benegal sees a lot of promise in these filmmakers but much water has flown since Benegal spoke After that we have seen films like Ritesh Batra's Lunchbox, Anand Gandhi's so called epic Ship of Theseus. So today's Falke lecture by Ashwin I hope is in a way a sequel to Sham Benegal's. To introduce today's lecture our guest speaker Ashwin as well as further proceedings may request our chair Rosie Thomas to come on stage. Thank you. it's a subject that um he is absolutely um on the ball with i think uh there's a lot of research needing to be done and he has got off the ground quickly and done um his phd at the uh in intercultural studies at heriot watt university in edinburgh um and um he's going to be first off the mark in terms of getting a book out on this topic um and he is the person who's done the in-depth research so we're very much looking forward to uh hearing what he's got to tell us about this um as a background to ashwin um he's been a visiting lecturer at st xavier's college mumbai and a channel 4 tv documentary researcher and filmmaker In 2014 Ashwin co-organized and curated Edinburgh's first ever independent Asian film festival featuring Scottish and world premieres of several independent films including the acclaimed Ship of Theseus. And Ashwin was recently selected as a BBC Academy BAME expert voice in cultural studies and the visual arts. His forthcoming book is entitled India's new independent cinema rise of the hybrid and it will be the first dedicated analysis of the new indian indies and will feature in the routledge advances in film studies series um ashwin would you like to come up to the podium the past should be altered by the present as much as the present is directed by the past I'm going to ask you to hold on to that thought by T.S. Eliot because it is going to return like a revenant to haunt this lecture at a later juncture. My odyssey into um the waters of new independent Indian cinema uncharted waters of new independent Indian cinema 
commenced with a rather singular headline in The Guardian. A new wave of Indian independent film is breaking the all singing, all dancing stereotype of Bollywood via low cost offbeat movies and edgier subject matter. Now this proclamation, theatrical in its urgency, seemed like the mutant love child of Marx and Engels' communist manifesto and a 1980s Bollywood melodrama. A new breed of topical, incisive, and visceral films is indeed populating the Indian cinematic space. I discovered that this phenomenon seemed particularly ascendant in 2010, a watershed a shed year signaling the arrival of the new Indies. To pose the rudimentary question, what are the new independent Indian films, runs the risk of opening up a Pandora's box. Academic literature and populist perception have largely colluded in the reductionist dichotomization of Indian cinema into Bollywood and Satyajit Ray. It also epitomizes how the essentializing of Indian cinema into Bollywood Ray rather astoundingly still pervades in the West. The advent of new independent Indian cinema carries with it the opportunity to dismantle these convenient compartments once and for all. So Rabindranath Tagore said, the world speaks to me in pictures, my soul answers in music. I shall now attempt to put into pictures what a new Indian indie looks like. in the footsteps of giants like Sham Benegal, who has stood behind this lectern and delivered a previous Falke lecture, it would be specious not to acknowledge that India's post-colonial art house, parallel, and middle cinemas stake a strong claim to being the progenitors of the new Indies. So it would therefore be accurate to term the new Indian Indies genetically modified mutants, like the aforementioned masala of Marx, Engels, and Bollywood. They conjoin the diverse characteristics of their cinematic parents, Bollywood, Parallel, and the regional cinemas of India, with a liberal sprinkling of world cinema in the mix. This is precisely why I mention in my forthcoming book that the growth of the new wave of Indian Indies is akin to the rise of a hybrid mutant. I look at the Indies as a global hybrid form, global in look and aesthetic, and local in content and storylines. The new indies are custom built, stylized, and idealized to tap into the anxieties, tensions, and conflicts of a metamorphosing India. In essence, the new indies narrate micro-narratives, the minority and alternative stories of nation, stories that scratch beneath the surface, stories that you don't get to see in Bollywood. Now, Plutarch, the historian of old, writes about the ancient Greek hero uh, Theseus and how he traveled to Crete and slew the monstrous Minotaur and returned back on this arduous journey home. Now, um, Plutarch talks about the ship of Theseus paradox. He asks us, 
if one were to take the rotting, worn-out planks from Theseus's ramshackle ship and introduce new planks painstakingly one by one, at what point would the old original ship of Theseus stop being the ship of Theseus? The philosopher Thomas Hobbes later adds, um, he says, if one were to collect all the worn out discarded parts of the old ship and assemble them so as to create a second new ship, which of the two ships is the actual authentic ship of Theseus? Food for thought. So here's my ship of Indian cinemas. In 1947, India, freed from the shackles of colonization, set sail on the rather choppy, tumultuous waters of envisioning a new cinema for the nation. Along the trajectory, the diachronic timeline of um, Indian cinema as it progressed, there was the accretion or the accumulation of various strands and genres and uh, types of Indian cinema. So you have the ubiquitous post-1947 art films with Satyajit Ray, Bimal Roy, and Rithvi Ghatak, and the rise of the popular Hindi uh, cinema, uh, 1969 heralded Bhuvan Shom and the parallel cinema movement, uh, the growth the burgeoning rise of parallel cinema in the 1970s with Sham Benegal and Mani Kaul, the auteurs. And in, 19, in the 1990s, we saw the rise of uh, urban English films, which amalgamated uh, English and Hindi dialogue. Uh, we also have to remember the regional and vernacular films, uh, the Tamil, Kannada, and um, Malayalam film industries, which had their own mainstream and parallel movements. And then we have the 1990s rupture, which is a huge event, a, a disjuncturing event in, in this linear, uh, ostensibly linear trajectory. Now the watershed of India's 1990s globalization steered the ship of Indian cinemas into the mainstream, where the growing Bollywood monolith transformed the ship from its diverse composition, the cinemas of India, into a Bollywood behemoth. So we now have Bollywood as this overarching, preeminent uh, form of cinema that casts its shadow over the cinemas of India, the other cinemas of India. Now the question I'd like you to ponder during this lecture and beyond is what happens when the Indies, the new independent Indies, a new form of Indian cinema, new planks in effect, are inserted into this big ship, the Bollywood behemoth. And does this then lead to a complete restructuring of the ship. What if the new Indies try to extricate themselves from the dominating superstructure of the Bollywood bulwark and attempt to create a separate autonomous space, a new and distinct ship? So I'm now gonna proceed and perform a flexible description of the new Indian Indies. During the course of, course of my field work in India, I had the opportunity to speak to several um, actors, filmmakers, directors, and Anusha Rizvi, who directed Peeply Live, was one of them. She makes a very cogent point. She says, the problem is that I don't understand the definition within which these things are set or are working, because if independent cinema is called such, because it has less than 50% studio money, if that's the definition they're working with, then that traditional definition of indie cinema can only work in the West and can't work in India. So there is an incommensurab incommensurability or an incompatibility with the archetypal quintessential uh, definition of indie cinema that stems from the West. Instead, um, we see the arrival of the Indies which have different sources of funding. Now the Indies uh, often have to align themselves with uh, big corporate production houses or Bollywood producers or Bollywood stars in order to uh, gain a wider audience. They're often bilingual and trilingual in their dialogue. Um, so they often amalgamate Hindi and English, but also uh, regional dialects. For example, in Peeply Live, there is the use of the Avadi dialect uh, when the film is 
set in rural regions and it then segues into English and Hindi when uh, the action is set in more urban or cosmopolitan locations. This harkens back to the English films that I mentioned uh, where there was Hindi and English dialogues, films like English August, Split Wide Open, uh, Bombay Boys, and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Iyer. So there is that kind of, uh, these films are to some extent a recrudescent manifestation of the earlier English, English films. Um, these films largely, the New Indies, ap appeal to a younger demographic in the age group of 20 to 30. So they also appeal to the polyglot and pluralistic composition of metropolitan cities like Mumbai, uh, Bangalore, and Delhi. They have themes and issues that address the state of the nation. Like I say, they tell stories uh, which are more or less micro-narratives, alternative renderings of nations. Uh, these include stories about farmer suicides, uh, disenfranchised youth, migrant laborers, and monks turned anti-cooperation animal rights agitators. So there's a, a cornucopia of uh, themes and issues that they, they address. I'm going to end on another um, aspect of censorship. The filmmaker O'Neill points out what he perceives as the disparate treatment of indie films in relation to Bollywood, where the CBFC turns a blind eye to scenes in Bollywood films that depict women as sex objects. This is a particular reference to the Bollywood item number, a sexualized song and dance sequence featuring an item girl. O'Neill ascribes the normalization of the item number in Indian popular culture to its endorsement by the regulatory establishment, namely the CBFC, as well as the Indian media. This le legitimization often overlooks or disregards the popularization of the item number's overt and subliminal link to the grim reality of rape in India. In an article entitled Molesters or Heroes, Anna Vetikad's questions, uh, she, she asks whether Bollywood blockbusters featuring industry stars, in her words, quote, continue the Bollywood tradition of sexually harassing their heroines under the guise of humor and romance. She asks, if Salman Khan lifts Jacqueline, Jacqueline Fernandez's skirt without her knowledge in the film Kick, and she shows anger at first, but soon dances merrily with him, the message to impressionable fans is that women secretly feel flattered by harassment, or what is euphemistically called teasing, end quote. The argument that national patriarchy is often underwritten by Bollywood highlights the new Indies broader representation of women in prominent roles in films like Dobi Ghat, Peeply Live, and Ship of Theseus. The indie space is also witnessing an increasing number of female directors, including Kiran Rao, Anusha Rizvi, Anjali Menon, and Geetu Mohandas, who is the director of uh, Liar's Dice, India's entry to this year's Oscar Awards. So, um, Summing up all the points, uh, there is quite a turbulent field, an obstacle-ridden path ahead of the new Indian Indies. It's fair to extrapolate them as the future of Indian cinema. However, there needs to be an independent, autonomous Indian infra infrastructure for their distribution and an exhibition, without which um, the future is fraught with peril. So uh, I'd like to end on a more positive note. Uh, drawing on some pop philosophy from the film, The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. Where does the ship go? Where does the ship of Indian cinemas with new Indian, the new Indian Indies at the helm? Can we chart the waters and where they're going? All I can say is everything will be all right in the end. So if it's not all right, it's not yet the end. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your very interesting lecture, full of facts and information. India makes thousands of films every year, and only about 10 are successful at the box office, and the remaining, I understand, lose money. My question to you is that the films that succeed seem to be the ones which show a lot of nudity, and lots of family, traditional people find it difficult to see with families. So is this the trend that is going to continue, that lots and lots of people are continuing to make heavy losses in films, 
and the film that will succeed will show more and more nudity. In terms of uh, nudity, now this is precisely what I mentioned in terms of the double standards exhibited by the C uh, Central Board of Film Classification. I think there's a dire need for severance uh, uh, between the mi Ministry of Information and Broadcasting and, and the CBFC because uh, governmental inf impingement or interruptions in this process is hugely detrimental to the freedom of speech and expression. That said, I would then reiterate how Bollywood gets away with item numbers which are then conventionalized in Indian popular culture, whereas uh, films that uh, have nudity as part of the contextualized uh, uh, narratives in, in the story are then proscribed or banned or um, subject to cuts. So I think uh, systems and practice, practices need to be developed which are more transparent in the fun, under the aegis of the CBFC in the first instance. Also, I think there's a widening conscience, particularly in cosmopolitan India, to the realities of you know, uh, freedom of expression in the sense that nudity is one of the things that is being debated in the public sphere. There was an NDTV program, We the People, where there was a debate on Gandhu and representations of sex. So I think younger audiences are opening out and broadening their, their minds in terms of representation. So I think that is going to be the more progressive outlook in the future, hopefully. Nikaji, can you look back and think of the first day you arrived in London and was, what was the weather like? Um, the weather, I came in September. So the weather was pretty okay. I don't think it was raining. Um, it was nice and clear. And uh, I was you know, in a state where you're really wondering what it's all going to be. And you come and see the building from the outside. It doesn't look all that great. But then you step in and you see that lovely foyer and you're like, whoa, I mean, is this where I'm going to be working and living? And it's been such a terrific journey since then. Did you find that the time has passed very quickly? Very quickly, and I blame all my friends for that because I made so many of them and they really made the time fly. And the work, of course, has been very interesting, very intense. Um, I've tried to do a lot of things, um, whatever I could think of to, you know, the change, the image, the, the style, the, you know, the way we work, the kind of things we do at the Nehru Center. And uh, that has taken a lot of um, uh, effort, emotional involvement. And I, I, I just love cultural work, so I guess it should. So. Tell me, for example, in an average week, what kind of mix of cultural events would you have? Uh, in a typical week, we'd maybe have a dance or a music. We'd have a talk. We would have um, something like, uh, you know, a demonstration, somebody coming in to do a lecture demonstration kind of a thing. Uh, we could have uh, perhaps a poetry reading or, you know, something to do with literature. So normally we have, and definitely one exhibition every week. So uh, we open on every Monday a new exhibition. So it's quite an eclectic mix of um, subjects that we, we uh, try to cover during any typical week. Now tell me something, you know London obviously is a very busy place with a lot of cultural events, a lot of cultural events, and uh, did you find getting a good audience a big challenge? Definitely, because um, there's so many things going on on any given day at any given time that it is a little difficult to attract people from you know so many other options that they have. But I must say that over the years, as we went along, and you know, like sort of you you begin to gauge the kind of things people really like to watch or to see. And uh, the fact is that the Nehru Center provides an alternative um, stage for artists and uh, speakers who would probably not get a hearing or would not be that popular on, you know, the, the usual, um, with the usual kind of crowd. So this is a niche place in many ways. Um, it offers the kind of opportunities to people that they probably wouldn't get anywhere. So that was one big draw. And people who, um, you know, are interested in getting to know the new and emerging India better from the cultural um, perspective. They found it very interesting. And then, of course, we always had a mix of, uh, you know, very popular programs, usually based on Bollywood. And those would draw in big crowds. So um, during my four years, virtually every, um, if not every month, definitely every second month, we'd have a really huge program where, you know, people would be sitting on the steps, standing at the doors and things like that. So um, I would say that it's been mixed. There certainly, there were certainly events where you know, there would be probably more people on the stage than in the audience. But that, fortunately, is becoming rarer and rarer. So. And do you feel that it's important to have yeah, cultural events in English or Hindi? Or does language make a big difference? 
language um, makes a difference depending on what kind of an event you're doing. For example, if you're doing um, something contemporary, then you, you are attracting a whole lot of young people. Um, many of our events have also drawn non-Indians. So in that case, it becomes necessary for, for, you, for you know, the, the speaker or the artist to stick to um, at least a good mix of Hindi and English so that nobody feels left out. Then, of course, there are these very typical kind of events like, you know, Bharatnatyam performance, uh, very, very traditional, um, you know, or something which has to have Hindi or Urdu as a, as, as a um, you know, background language. For example, if it's uh, an Urdu poetry recital, you can't possibly do it in English. So, but then, of course, that draws the kind of crowd that really enjoys that, appreciates that. So, we've tried to stick to, again, that kind of a judicious mix of, uh, you know, what language you use. Um, sometimes, um, the, the speakers themselves, after a while, they realize that you know, maybe Hindi is not working, so they'll switch to the other language and vice versa. So uh, we sort of you know, played by the ear and get along. But yeah, we do encourage a good mix of languages because one of um, the uh, mandates of the Nehru Center, as you probably know, is to act as a bridge between communities. And for that, um, being um, uh, you know, comprehensible to people is very important. Looking back on these four years, do you think really that you're very happy with what you've achieved and any particular example? Um, uh, as I was saying, um, I would give myself maybe 75 to 80 percent. Nobody can get 100 except in Delhi University. <laughs> but um, the fact remains that um, I think to a large extent I have uh, managed to change um, the profile of the Nehru Center have managed to bring in um, the kind of programs and audiences that uh, should have been here for a long time, but you know, for various reasons, were not working out. Initially, I had a bit of a problem because you know, you you inherit a certain system and you go along with it till you can figure out what you want to do. But after the first year, I must say that um, things I, I did shape things the way I wanted to, and I'm happy with it more or less. Of course, there are uh, constraints as well, like there's, there's always a resource constraint. You, you want to do so much, but you can't, um, especially on the outreach front where you want to you know, work with other people. But uh, very often, you do, simply do not have the resources to do that. So then you try to find you know, other ways of, of getting around that problem. Yes, in fact, um, Lalitji, you know, we did this Devanand Memorial Evening with him about in 2012, and that brought the house down. We had the number of people we had here and how much everyone enjoyed it. That was an outstanding event. Some of the events we've done with Katha UK, with um, uh, Tejendra Sharma of Katha UK, they have been fabulous. Then recently we did um, a beautiful um, uh, Shamo Sher Shame Shero Sh Sukhan, and that is an evening of Urdu poetry. And um, some poets themselves were there, there, and they were readings of poetry, and an absolutely phenomenal response. Then there have been a couple of plays that we have done, uh, which have drawn um, huge crowds and very appreciative uh, audiences. So yeah, these are the milestones that I would very fondly uh, look back on. Two last questions. One, how closely do you have to work with the High Commission and, and how is that relationship? We are in many ways autonomous. I guess that's one of the reasons why we are, we are based in a, in a different building. We don't sit in the High Commission. So essentially, uh, what we are supposed to do is I make the calendar, I decide um, you know, what kind of events we are going to have, and then before it all goes into print for the brochure, we show it to the High Commissioner just in case you know, they have any objections about the politics of it or whatever you know we try to st to stay away from non-cultural subjects but sometimes you can't avoid it for example even in today's uh, you know lecture there were a few references to you know uh, the government and its policies I said, you can't avoid that but in general once I have approved, then it goes to the High Commissioner, they approve. And to uh, the extent that I'm also from the Foreign Service and therefore a part of um, the Ministry, I'm always a part of whatever happens at the High Commission. So, you know, you go for all the official meetings and, um, you know, to, to the extent that you're required to contribute your two-bit, you do it. But um, I'm, um, I, I must say that overall it's, a, it's an independent charge, so you are more or less free to do, um, do things the way you want. Last question, now when you're going away, what is it about London that you're going to really miss? My friends and the weather. The weather, I know people here who live here, they, they really think that it's a crappy kind of weather and it rains too much. But for, for, for those of us who come from India and the heat 
of Delhi, this is like bliss. So I'm really enjoying my last few hours of, of being here and enjoying it. Plus the fact that uh, both my children had a great time here. My uh, younger daughter, um, who is a special needs child, she, she, was, um, she had a lovely experience in school and she has grown and matured so much in the four years that I'm very happy with the way she's progressed. My older one finished her post-graduation and now she's, well, ready for the job market, whatever that may mean. So both of them have had a great time. I've had a great time because of my friends, um, the fact that, uh, you know, I, I live in work in this beautiful building that itself I think I'm going to really miss doing that so yeah so many things I mean it's difficult to really pinpoint but these are the major things thank you